It has been obviously a horrific year. Uh, we're talking about the outbreak of the largest land war, the largest conflict in, in Europe since the end of the Second World War. This war has taken an enormous toll on the Ukrainian society. The Russians have implemented a punishment campaign against the Ukrainian population. The United States has formally determined that Russia has committed crimes against humanity. They continue to use the most brutal uh, war atrocities of, of looting, rape. We have seen so many examples of Ukrainians all across the country sacrificing so much, uh, their lives, their children, their homes, uh, losing so much. And that has created uh, a much more uh, steel will uh, to keep fighting. At the one-year mark of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we need to pause and reflect and consider what lies ahead in year two. In year one, Ukrainians proved their resolve to withstand the existential threat Russia poses. Ukrainians survived, they remain united, they endured. But at an extraordinary human toll, often not easy to see, the entire population subject to attacks upon power grids, water supplies, and civilian residences. Victory rests not simply on armor and technology, it rests on human and civic strength. It rests on a society that is finite, that cannot magically be doubled in size, and that does not have an inexhaustible supply of fighters. It is a nation that has to dig ever more deeply to defend itself against Russian terror with the help of its allies. The investigation documents how Russia appears to have both deliberately and indiscriminately targeted Ukraine's health system during its war of aggression as part of a broader attack on Ukraine's civilian population and infrastructure. The data set shows that at least 707 violent attacks on hospitals, health workers, and other medical infrastructure have been perpetrated. These attacks have devastated Ukraine's health system during the first year of Russia's full-scale invasion. І прямий вплив також полягає і на психічне і здоров'я, і психоемоційний стан кожного українця. Russia began the war by claiming that Ukraine and Russia were essentially one country, that they uh, were brothers, uh, Slavic fellows who belonged together. Uh, and yet the manner in which they have conducted the war uh, uh, is hardly what you would call a familial. Uh, they seem to be pursuing what you might call a destroy the country in order to save it uh, uh, practice of the war, uh, including a large number of what appear to be war crimes, crimes against civilians, uh, uh, ethnic cleansing at times, uh, and really notable for their insistence upon prosecuting the war outside of the boundaries of what you might consider traditional military to military conflict. It is impossible to overstate the impact on every aspect of Ukrainian society. Let's take just a few examples economically. Ukraine's GDP has dropped 40% in the last year. That means that entire swaths of the country, entire swaths of the economy are focused solely on the war itself rather than anything that they were producing before. Uh, in terms of daily life, there's no family here. There is no part of the country that hasn't been affected, just permeates uh, the entire society and every single family 
uh, in this country. I think there are two likely scenarios over the course of 2023. One is that the war of attrition continues, that neither side can make any progress in political negotiations, and we see that kind of trench warfare continue. My fear is that Russian bodies continue to pile up, both wounded and dead, that the Russians continue to lash out, probably increasingly so, at the Ukrainian population. The second scenario is, particularly from the Russian side, that they decide to push for a temporary ceasefire. Now, I don't think Putin is, is willing to settle this war permanently. They're probably willing to fight for years if they don't get uh, as much of Ukraine as they want right now. But a ceasefire would mean we'd get a temporary halt for some period of time. I think as long as the Ukrainians are receiving economic support from the West, diplomatic support from the West, and military support, particularly key aspects, key weapon systems like HIMARS, key munitions, aircraft, tanks, that the Ukrainian population, as many populations on the receiving end of an invasion that they will likely be able to continue to fight on. If you were to tell me that uh, the European Union was about to launch its 10th round of sanctions, that one or two countries, uh, Russia applying its uh, its malign influence, uh, its, its economic tools that has used, weaponizing energy, weaponizing food, would have changed Europe's calculation. I would have said likely. There were many divisions, there were many cracks that Russia could have exploited. But thus far, uh, the European Union has has remained very much united and very much in solidarity with Ukraine. And I would say the same thing here. Despite some fracturing, um, there is strong bipartisan support for Ukraine. And we begin with breaking news. President Biden is in Kyiv, Ukraine, right now, the country's capital, as that country prepares to mark one year since Russia's full-scale invasion. President Putin chose this war. Every day the war continues is his choice. No one, no one can turn away their eyes from the atrocities Russia is committing against the Ukrainian people. It's abhorrent. It's abhorrent. In year two, the human dimension of this war will loom ever larger. We should anticipate widening cracks, greater migration, continued high battlefield losses, trauma and economic decline. Ukraine is in a race against time in which the Western alliance has both a moral and strategic obligation to stay the course, to do more and to do better. The Ukrainian nation remains acutely dependent on its external allies and cannot afford at this historic moment any softening of that support.